Well, um, I'm going to officially welcome you. Good afternoon. I am Jennifer Rostari Dickinson, Director of Education at the Stark Museum of Art, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this afternoon's Lunch and Look at Home, creating the Stark Cultural Venues Coloring Book. Um, today, I am just playing moderator and host, and I am the slide tech behind the scenes, but I'm thrilled to have Karen Leonard, our teaching artist and the designer of our coloring book here with us um, to talk about what the process of creating this coloring book. Um, and so today's program, we're gonna spend about 35, 45 minutes. Karen's gonna talk about each of the images, the whole process of creating them. And then we'll have about 15 minutes for questions and answers. If you have questions during the program, I'm gonna encourage you to use that chat option down on the bottom of your screen. Go ahead and put that question in when you think of it. And when we get to the question and answer portion of the program, we will go through those. Um, it looks like everyone has their mics off. That's the only other request I have for you at this time is just to go ahead and turn off those mics. That makes it um, so that everyone can be sure we don't have any interruptions. And other than that, I am going to uh, turn the screen over to Karen. All right. So, hi, everyone. I'm an artist based here in Orange, Texas, and I work at the Stark Museum of Art as one of the teaching artists, which means that I lead the studio art projects like workshops, field trips, and camps for students and adults. I also create coloring books. My first book was published several years ago and is available on Amazon. You can find me on Facebook and Instagram through Kaylin Art and visit my website for more direct engagement. My style, as you can already see, is busy and wild. We're gonna start by talking about my process from reference to pencil drawing to print. Then I'll discuss the first images and how this book, Welcome to Stark Cultural Venues, came to exist. Then I'm gonna go over each of the images and we'll have those questions. Starting at the very beginning, a full coloring book was not really the goal. I'm gonna talk about creating this piece in full detail, start to finish, to show my artistic process. I was sent this image by the Curator of Education, Jennifer Rostoy Dickinson, to use in a Make Art Monday project. She wanted this image turned into a coloring book for anyone to be able to download. Ultimately, I used this photo for the main shape and the angle of the museum. However, it's undergone a few changes since this photo. So I went ahead and found um, a few photographs of my own. And the first thing that's evident in my photograph is that the landscaping has completely changed. Uh, the big bushes are gone. It's filled with a variety of plants that thrive in Southeast Texas. The trees in the background are of course bigger. And there's one other addition. The little guy in the photo is a, actually that large fawn sculpture by Dan Ostermiller of A Sleeping Bear. That piece is called Oblivious and it was installed outside of the museum on the portico. The final size of the sheet was going to be eight and a half by 11 to allow for easy printing. This is something that people would have to download. Um, so I resized the images that I liked and redrew the edge lines to make them more visible. I sketched in some updates. I eliminated some shadows. I also liked the clouds in my new photograph because they reminded me of some of the sweeping dramatic skies in Fremont Ellis's paintings, which is a great way for me to connect what's inside the museum to what was going to be outside in this landscape. So I created this image using the Fresh Paint program on a Surface XP tablet. And now that I had a good idea of the overall layout, I transferred this to a piece of paper. Drawing on paper helps me with a few things. It mainly allows me to have more freedom from the photograph. I feel less tied to the reality of it and I can add some more fantastical elements. I'm also really familiar with the nature, the tactile nature of paper because that's how we learn, that's how we grow. Um, if there's a pattern that's not working on paper, I notice it a little easier. Um, I locked the screen and I used it like a light board to transfer my design. And now that I had a basic drawing ready, it's time to work on the details. I darkened up some lines that I liked, correct, corrected the shapes, and was left with mostly blank slate to fill up. 
The first area that I ended up tackling was the skyscape. I tried several different patterns based on the shape of blue bonnets. Go to the, to the blue bonnets, there we are. Um, that which is of course the state flower of Texas. I chose blue bonnets because the Stark Cultural Venues has always built a strong connection to its local community here in Orange, Texas. Since they weren't already going to be part of the landscape, it was important to me to signal to the viewer that the museum is 100% based in Texas. And you can show uh, right there, you can see those blue bonnets right in the sky. For the landscape, I repeatedly went back and referenced the new photographs for plants, oblivious, and the sidewalk areas. I left the white outside walls of the museum completely open. The contrast of busy shapes in the landscape and calm space in the museum really helps set the mood of the museum as an inviting area, as well as a reflection of the calm atmosphere found within it. Go ahead and show the next slide. And next you can see the finished pencil drawing. And now I have to turn this into a much cleaner looking image. Uh, if you'll see the scan on the next page. Crisp contour lines can be created in two different ways. I can either draw directly with pen on paper and then scan it later into the computer, or I can just draw directly through the computer. I knew for sure that I wanted to make sure the perspective on the museum was as perfect as it could be. So I moved straight into doing this, the rest of this, onto my Surface XP, which is a tablet computer. I started with Inkscape, which is a vector-based program for the Museum of Science. Here I can control the lines to the most minute angle and make sure everything moves to the same vanishing point on the horizon, which you can actually see on that image on the right-hand side. The black lines in the picture are created in Inkscape while those gray lines are an underlay of my pencil drawing. Without the underlay, the lines of the museum and additional walls are seen there, they are perfectly straight and lined up. A few corrections were made here, which made me really grateful that I took this extra step instead of moving over to freehand drawing right away. And then I transferred a project over to Artweaver. The Artweaver program is very similar to Photoshop, Adobe Photoshop, if you know that one. Um, you can draw with it, do a lot of photograph manipulation with it. The previous line file made in Inkscape was transferred into a PNG. And again, you can see the pencils that I've put in an underlay as well. After matching the lines one more time, it's time to get started on inking the piece. I use a pressure sensitive tablet pen and I have a brush personally custom created for coloring sheet lines that match the size of the lines in Inkscape. Because I'm using a free hand pen, you can see wobbly lines and natural strokes. Um, it is possible I can create these lines in Inkscape as well, but those look a little too smooth and mechanical and I wanted to come away from that. I want to you, give you the look of hand-drawn results that you get from pen. Those pencil layers are frequently removed after a section is complete so I can check on my progress. Even though the pencils are already laid out, I still use the reference photos often for inspiration when an area just isn't looking quite right. And this is the part in the process in which I play a little music and relax while drawing. The designs have sort of been set up for me. So I set for a few hours at a time and work on each section to fill it in. Adding in the lines is very meditative for me. It's similar to the parts later on when you get to color it in, you know, where you get your coffee, your pencils, your music, and you settle down for a little while. Uh, this was created in July, August of 2020 in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic. We were all still working part-time staggered schedules at the museum. So this was nice to be able to work on a project that did not rely completely on a resource inside the museum. I had everything I needed right at home with me. With the lines finished, I set aside the project for a few days and I came back at it later with some fresh eyes. There were a few areas that to me were a little too dense with lines and I broke them up. 
I had also been toying with the idea of fading out the sky to set it further into background. The entrances also had been a sticking point for me. In person, when you see it, it's always darkened, but I didn't want to leave it solid black. And I found some inspiration in the sunburst pattern on the main doorways. And I like the symmetry of the door patterning being placed in the full entrance area. And here's the finished coloring page you will find as the Make Art Monday download on the Stark Museum of Arts Facebook page. And this is my version of it colored in, if you'll show that. I used watercolor pencils and had a fun time with it. And I'd love to see yours. We have a Facebook thread where you can share your coloring masterpieces of the museum. My line style is wild and highly patterned. It's there for you to take in and you can take it in very bright abstract territory or you can keep it realistic and follow some basic shapes. Jennifer, did you end up adding in yours? No, I didn't, I'm sorry. Oh, well, I have it though, I can run it to your office, but I have it. Oh, we'll show it later. But you can see there's areas where I did a solid blue sky. You could have easily patterned that back and forth and done some crazier stuff with it. So that was the first coloring page that I made. The coloring book as a whole hadn't been conceived of yet. In the summer of 2020, we were given a challenge to work through how to create a collaborative project involving hundreds of participants while maintaining social distancing. Uh, crowding around a single large project was just not feasible anymore, but we still wanted to engage people with a sort of community project, even if it looked different. I based my concept off of this artwork by Leon Gospard. This is a busy and exciting painting called San Geronimo Fiesta. The idea was a cross between a coloring book and a puzzle. Starting with the painting and this line drawing that I created, the group would learn a bit of the history and then we'd give them a piece to work on. This page would be blown up large enough to fit up to a seven foot by 13 foot canvas and divided into smaller sections. And then those sections would each be their own coloring book page. Members could color those individually and we would collect and reassemble them into a full display. Um, you'll see an example of what the top corner could look like. If you flip to the next one. Since everyone would be working independently of each other, the colors would be busy and unpredictable. Therefore having thick black lines to tie the drawing all back together would be extremely important. But those colors would also evoke the busy fiesta atmosphere in the, of the original painting in a fun, fresh new way. The project is still in development within the education department, but we had this page handy. When the CEO of the Nelda C. and H.J. Lecture Stark Foundation, Tad McKee, expressed interest in building a coloring book to represent the venues, Jennifer Restoy Dickinson was able to point to these two works that were already created of the museum and the fiesta. At this point, they made the decision to have me continue and create a full series to represent the whole foundation. So then I went back and updated San Geronimo Fiestas to fit the scale of the project. Um, the size of course is different, but you can see that there's more detail. There's some finer lines, some texture up in the sky, faded areas as well. So I think this is a little better suited to uh, the individual adult colorist. And with two pieces already representing the Stark Museum of Art, Dr. Sarah Bain, the curator, chose one additional piece for me to base a page from. This is the Mirage by Thomas Moran. I absolutely encourage anyone who can visit it in person to do so. It is a large six foot long painting with a bench in front of it, so you can sit down and soak it in. I actually learned about this painting in a survey of Western art course about 15 years ago from Professor Nancy Siegel at Juniata College. It captivated me then, but now it's left me with a huge challenge. How do you turn something that's supposed to evoke a feeling of grand nature, illusion and wonder into one small page line drawing? I settled on patterning, the same diamond pattern that's in the sky is brought down into the mesas. 
Only the density of the lines is your clue as to where they begin, where the dark and light gradient of the Vox come down, and where the shadows reside. This mirage, I think, is going to be really difficult for you to decide how to color, but it's also one of the most fun to look at once it's complete. Um, again, I left some areas clear. You've got the foreground on the shore that's empty, while you see into the shimmering pool of the scene that is the Green River in Wyoming. Then the team at Shangri-La Botanical Gardens sent me a collection of photographs to work with. The first one I chose was titled The Cypress Gate at the Pond of the Blue Moon. This gate was created by trees that were downed after the devastating Hurricane Vega. It's a beautiful calming site that represents to me a welcoming atmosphere. But it uses pieces from a turbulent past and I like that dichotomy. The scenery of the Cypress Gate in my image has been abstracted. The trees in the background are simplified and the ones in the foreground are left open for your own color decisions. The roof of the gate was tricky to render in proportion, but the parallel lines help draw the eye in the correct directions. And the flowing lines in the background of the sky and water were created from tracing those of a paper ink marbled feast that I had made in 2019. I felt that the marbling captured movement in an unusual way that helps to reflect the cypherscape's history with a visual metaphor. This creates a space for the colorist's mind to wander. And when you do things that don't require precision or presence, your brain can decouple from reality and it allows you to focus only on your thoughts. You make more mistakes. And that area, that swirling area is made for mistakes. It's for whirling thoughts to be made into a hurricane of your own design. The next piece that I chose to represent Shangri-La was this view titled The Fish Pond. From here, you can also see the greenhouses with their honeysuckle covered entrance. I walk through the gardens so often with my children. So when I see this picture, I immediately sense the rest of the gardens. Um, I know that the algae covered lake is to the left with the lawns behind me after a wandering pathway covered with boxtail ferns. Beyond the greenhouses are the children's gardens filled with vegetable plants and a stand to look for bees. And this photograph gives me an unmistakable sense of place. Uh, this could not be anywhere else other than at the garden. So um, mine, I feel like is, a, is an experience of feeling like you're walking through it. The multitude of brickwork is a little crazy, so I ended up fading it out as you go back, otherwise it would be too dense. The uh, three-dimensional quality around the fish pond really sticks up nicely. The, um, the roofs of the greenhouses were transformed into honeycomb patterns. You're gonna see that along that line there. And I especially like the dripping trees in the middle ground on the right hand side. I think those are gonna be a lot of fun to color. I'm gonna be super honest with you. I've never seen actual fish in that pond. There are fish in other areas of Shangri-La. So I got to use my imagination at this point and I added a basic goldfish type fish into the pond and tessellated them in a rounded pattern. They alternate in rings swimming in opposite direction as inspired by M.C. Escher's two fish seen here. They all sit together like a puzzle. Technically, there's no water to be seen, it's only fish, which I think makes a really interesting focal point for the page. The last photograph I chose to reference for Shangri-La is this one of the snowy egrets taken from their habitat over Ruby Lake. When I go to Shangri-La with my children, Far and away, the biggest thing that they want to do is go to the Heronry Blind to watch the egrets and see if they can catch a glimpse of that alligator. These birds have nests close enough to the blind that they can be seen very clearly without binoculars. On a good day, we can spot over two dozen snowy egrets. I left the branches and trunks as a web for the colors to unravel. They look a bit like stairs or a ladder leading up into the sky but the branches are so precarious and thin, it's like the egrets are gonna jump off right away at any minute to go fishing. I originally left out that egret in the middle, 
because he's got his wings played out at such an awkward angle. But I kept him anyway. <laughs> I like his no-nonsense attitude. He's a little silly. We need that. I didn't want to leave the background, though, plain black or white, as that's obviously not my style. I looked for an inspiration on wave patterns, and I found a good point in Hamonshu, which is an entire guidebook on wave and ripple designs by Yuzan Mori. I used those humped waves with a few splashes to make it interesting. And this really makes Ruby Lake's waters look more turbulent than they are in a literal sense. But the truth is that that lake is teeming with animals and plants. And the wave background I've included is reflective of this habitat's busy activity in a more metaphorical sense. Changing locations were situated now in the music room at the historical WH Dark House. Miriam Lutcher, WH Dark's wife, played the Steinway Grand Piano, seen in the background. I visited the house and heard the piano played by the Stark Museum's registrar at the time, Catherine Berry, during a lovely Mother's Day tour that focused on Miriam's touches to the house. I tightened the focus on the room and made the walls and curtains point in a lot of ways ver vertically. Miriam had this room decorated with cherubs, so it was important to me to direct the eye up a bit into heaven. The rugs and patterning on the chair were difficult for me to see from photographs, and the house was closed at this time while I was doing the page for re renovation. So I looked into Miriam's other belongings to help fill up some patterning ideas. Starting with this Staffordshire plate on the main rug. Let's zoom in a bit. You should be able to see more clearly the floral pattern emerging from the Staffordshire plate that's used on my version of the rug down at the very bottom. And for the upholstery of the couches and chairs, I selected this Staffordshire picture. In another close up, we can see the swans placed on the couch and the flowers and foliage on the chairs, all contributing to a really rich, comfortable, courtly environment. This room is the most formal room, but it's also lively with music. In here, W.H. Stark and his son, Lecture Stark, played the violin alongside Miriam's piano. So I hope you can really see that this room is comfortable and well used, but very stately. This is a lamp here in the W.H. Stark house. The wisteria branches hide wiring and glass clusters actually have bulbs with them. The lamp still works, but apparently it is a huge pain to change the bulbs. So the house does not turn it on very often. It's a lovely bronze sculpture with a Renaissance revival aesthetic of a woman in a toga stepping through a wisteria forest, looking like she's trying to find her way. I had designed all of the pages to be in a landscape layout and I didn't want this one to be different. So I asked Hannah Danielson, the public engagement manager of the WH Dark House for another photo that showed a bit more of the surroundings. The first thing you can tell from this photo is that the lamp is huge. <laughs> I couldn't tell that from the earlier one. This is quite the piece to really have shipped out halfway around the world. Um, I then paid it more attention as well to the window treatment, the lacework curtains. These curtains are replicas of the originals that were hanging in the house. I decided to use those curtains as the background to this coloring page. I think the juxtaposition, the juxtaposition of all the elements really tells you a lot about their style. This is the Renaissance revival of a Greek figure worked into a German lamp with a natively Asian wisteria plant against English lace curtains, only recently invented to them in the mid 1800s. The Letcher Stark family was wealthy and worldly. They loved collecting and finding pieces from around the world. And I feel like this coloring page is meant to be a sample of their passion for cultural discovery. And of course, I had to include a view of the house in full. This is a wonderful photograph of the house as seen from Green Avenue. This is a view, this is the view that I see every day at work as I drive or walk up to the Stark Museum of Art. It's a Queen Anne style home built in 1894, and it is now considered a historical Texas landmark here in Orange, Texas. In the exhibit currently on display in the Stark Museum of Art, featuring these works is also a video of me at my tablet drawing the house. If you'd like to see it, the video condenses about eight to 10 hours of work in, sped up into just a short 
40 minutes. In the summer of 2020, the WH Stark House led this reading summer program with Alice in Wonderland, the children's book by Lewis Carroll. My children participated and had a blast reading and playing games from the activity kit that Joshua Cole and Hannah Danielson created. Miriam Lutcher gifted her son this copy of the book. I'm a little more familiar, however, with the original version of Alice in Wonderland with Sir John Tenniel's illustrations. So I flipped through my copy for some inspiration. And this picture here, you can see on the croquet grounds, the Queen of Hearts shouting for Alice's head. And I mind this scene for the most patterning. Starting with hearts. The hearts from their suit show up in the peaks of that gingerbread trim and on the tips of the fence line. The band of the king's sash ends up to be the whole railing of the balcony and the porch. The arms of a man presenting the crown appear in the peaks of the topmost windows. That rug, I don't know if you can see it, but it's on the ground there, has a scale pattern that I ended up using on all of the roofing. The crown has a fleur de lis motif that's repeated around all of those windows. In this scene, you can see some cards painting the roses red. So of course those roses can be seen in a shrubbery along the fence and against the house. And in the scene where Alice grows larger and larger in the white Travis house, she's pushing against a window. That diamond pattern of the window is found on all of the windows of the house. Each of these symbols taken individually wouldn't tie the illustration necessarily to Alice in Wonderland. Uh, but taken as a whole, it's unmistakably inspired by the body of Sir John Tenniel's works as done in the book by Lewis Carroll. It adds whimsy and it hints to Miriam Lutcher's love of literature. And the last major venue to conquer from the Stark Foundation was the theater. The Lutcher Theater for the Performing Arts hosts traveling Broadway plays and musical groups here in Orange, Texas. The most dazzling part of the theater is the stage itself, which was a bit of a challenge. Creating bold spotlights that would also be fun to color stumped me for a while. Um, I actually left this as one of the last pieces to tackle. I initially focused on the outward rays of light streaming, but they were a little too distracting from the other main elements, the stage and the curtains. This design ended up incorporating stage lights in a radial pattern and where two lights hit, the lines are wider and reveal more white space. This creates an artificial lighting effect. I kept the straight lines beyond the stage though, making the light behave differently on the stage as it does compared to the spillover into the theater. And this creates a separation between the magic of the stage and the viewing area from the audience. And I think there are a ton of different ways you could color this piece. Um, so I'm really excited to see how people interpret it as light is such a valuable element of art and theater. And then we turn our gaze back into the audience. This theater holds 1,450 seats, including the balcony level. More arrays of lights can be seen and the shape of the theater as a whole is acoustically wonderful. I sat in this audience during the theater's 40th anniversary in 2019. And if you haven't already noticed, um, I'm severely hearing impaired. I was, seating in the I was seated in the center in the main level, but I was able to hear everything on stage without any additional accommodations. That's how good it is. So I will admit that I did not draw each of the 1,450 seats individually. <laughs> Some are cut off to the edge, to the bottom left and right, but for those visible, I drew half of them on one side and then mirrored it. I probably only drew about 700 seats. On the side walls, I added the scroll design hinting to the 70s, 80s era, as the theater was built in the late 70s and opened to its first show in 1980. On the back walls are a series of piano keys, which references the Lecture Theater's opening, the very first show performed by Mr. Piano playing showmanship himself, Liberace, on February 7th in 1980. I dug deeper as well into the history of piano, but the music notes on the ceiling. 
Here you can see the first ever written piece of music by Giustini in 1732. It would be another 30 years before anyone else would publish music written for the piano. Now snippets from that music are reflected in the lecture theater on the ceiling of the balcony in the highest ceiling. Music is just part of a legacy that echoes throughout the ages connecting the Lutcher Theater to this. And for the last page in the series of the, Lutcher, of the theater venue, I chose this photograph of the theater. It's had the sun setting on the building. This is a six story theater, which is the largest building in downtown Orange. The architecture matches the Stark Museum of Art, which you saw earlier in the series. The shape of the building harkens so much to the museum that I wanted to set it apart. This time the walls are covered in designs. The sun's rays drip from the sky and the trees and landscaping really take over that front end. The area left clear here are the pathways inviting you to walk on up. The full name of the theater owes itself to Frances Ann Lutcher. She had an opera house built in the late 1800s, which has long since burned down. The modern lecture theater is a way of honoring her dedication to theater and the arts. She is photographed here with orchids, and I've set a pattern of orchids on the main squat part of the theater. She had greenhouses of over 200 varieties of beautiful orchids and was nicknamed the Orchid Lady for her habit of gifting orchids to soldiers traveling by train through Orange who had headed to Europe for World War I. After the series was complete, I was also commissioned to create one final piece that would act as the cover of the coloring book. After toying with the design that incorporated several already existing images, we thought to do an all new piece that featured the Stark Park. The Stark Park is set physically in between the WH Stark House, the Stark Museum of Art, and the Lecture Theater for the Performing Arts. Community events like the yearly art in the park are held here. I snapped this photo on a previous visit to the park and I used it as my reference. Since this page was going to be the representative piece for the Stark venues as a whole, I used this chance to make a few extra references that didn't quite make the cut into the individual pages. The Stark cultural venues is made possible because of the Nelda C. and H. J. Lutcher Stark Foundation, whose wealth comes from the Lutcher and Moore Lumber Company. That lumber company used a star and crescent moon logo. They branded their locks with it. The star can be seen in the sky, woven into a pattern up there, and a reflection of the crescent moon is seen in the surface of the fountain. The other thing that I hadn't really placed into the other pages was their dedication to preserving knowledge. The books on the retaining wall of the fountain represent the Eunice Barb Lankenstein Library and Archives that are housed with the Stark Museum of Art. The design on the top edge is made to look like the roots of the tree of knowledge. The weaving knot design is inspired by the style of the Celtic knotwork depicted in the Book of Kells, which is an amazing illuminated manuscript of the Testaments of the Bible, a nod as well to Francis Ann Lutcher's investments in the First Presbyterian Church of Orange. The cover of the book is on matte paper, meaning that it can be colored just like all the rest of the pages. However, here is the full piece without the logos. This is also the version that's on display in the exhibit currently at the Stark Museum of Art. I really do enjoy making coloring pages. I think there's a very blurred line between what is original, what is inspired by, and what makes art unique. By creating pieces that aren't necessarily complete, you become the artist too. Um, these works are meant to engage you and your aesthetic in the most direct sense, not just as a viewer, but as an artist yourself, by getting you to sit down with them. When you work on a page, you're gonna notice even more hidden symbols, more patterns, and more places that interest you. Uh, my philosophy as an artist is not to create work that's complete. Uh, I was given a chance to name this exhibit. And despite the room being all light and the pieces being black and white, I named it Welcome to Color. This is because with this book or a download of it, you are welcome to color. Thank you.
Karen, thank you so much. That was, I know I certainly enjoyed that. Every time we um, go through this, I just learn so much and I'm so glad to have had the opportunity to present this. Um, are there questions? At this time, we'll open up. If you have questions, you're free to put them into the chat or um, if you'd like to turn on your mic and ask them, Karen, I know would be happy to answer those for you as well. So just a comment in here from Trina Nelson Thomas. She says, I love hearing about the inspiration for each piece. Absolutely fascinating. I hope all Stark Foundation staff have an opportunity to view this program in the future. Thank you so much, Karen. Sarah Bame is asking, thank you. That was excellent. It was interesting to learn about your inspirations. What are you planning next? What comes next in the coloring book series? Um, well, let's see, the first book that I created years ago was um, about mythical creatures from around the world. And I'm going to uh, dial it in a bit and do something that's a little more familiar to people, um, your horoscope. It'll be a series of zodiac designs. That's exciting. And I can, I know I can speak from the education side. Um, you're not, we're not quite yet done with the Stark Museum of Art pages either. Um, as long as we have Karen on hand, I think we'll be seeing some more of those coming out um, in the future. We might take a little bit of a break. We put, Karen's worked very hard on these for about six months. So other questions or thoughts, things you'd like to share? Well, Karen, thank you so much. This was uh... Wow, I was blown away with uh, your commentary and the depth of uh, meaning in each drawing that you did, the, the care, the uh, attention to understanding every aspect of the scene and bring in all different kinds of aspects into one scene. Uh, I, I've always been a fan of M.C. Escher. I just love that his uh, works with illusion and drawing. And um, of course, uh, I am familiar with the two fish, but also his other things where he was having doves blend in together. And that goldfish pond was just, uh, oh, that was inspired. That was just awesome. But uh, every other attention to detail you put in was just, wow, I, I, that was wow. Uh, you could spend all day on each painting going into, I mean, each drawing going into the, the symbolism and the meaning behind all that. And I, I, I deeply appreciate that. And uh, it's going to be a wonderful resource for all eternity. As long as the foundation's around, it'll be a, it's something that will never age, will never uh, uh, grow old and uh, will be timeless. So thank you so much, Karen. And I can't wait to see what you've done and, I uh, can't wait to go look at your mystical uh, creatures thing. So thank Ooh, you. So Trina's asking if you have started coloring in your coloring book yet. Um, no, <laughs> I haven't. My wife got a lot of those coloring books and she bought all the little colored pencils. And so she's uh, shipped off all the colored pencils to uh, little kids in the neighborhood and West Orange Stark. And so, uh, I, I don't have a, a box of uh, colored pencils to do that. So I'll get onto that. But my son who has artistic ability uh, does things like that colors. But um, mm -hmm. I was never gifted with any artistic ability. I have zero. So well, you know, I do admire what other people can do. You know, in education, we believe that the more you practice, the better, the more confident you are. I know I've certainly heard Karen say that to students before. So I think education, just be looking in your inner office mail tab. You may be finding some gifts from education shortly. Okay, okay. Well, I uh, when I go babysit my grandson for two weeks, I'm sure I'll have plenty of time uh, <laughs> to work on coloring things. So, but anyway, thank you, Karen. This was wonderful just delightful. Well, hopefully um, my promise of blowing your mind um, with all of the references uh, played out to be true. Karen did ask me to show the one, this is, I did not color this. One of our educators, Trisha Stroud cover, colored this one. Um, but this is one that has been living in our office. Um, and I must confess, I have not made time to color and I have to do that. So um, we, we definitely want to see your colored pages. Mm -hmm. um so uh we will please feel free to share this with us as as you wish so karen is there anything you want to add to today's program before we wrap up 
Sure. Well, Tess is talking about um, noticing now the symbolism and the pieces that go into it. And it's interesting because I feel like a lot of time as artists, we are pressured to not talk about it. Just present the work and let the viewer figure it out. And um, a lot of times that works. But peeling back the curtain and showing you at least my thoughts, uh, hopefully gives you a little better perspective as where I'm coming from. And all of the pieces of knowledge that I've gleaned from working here at this foundation for the last couple of years really all gets poured into it. Art is not a one and done thing. It's about bringing your own life experiences and putting it on there. And you as an artist, when you come and sit down with this coloring pages, you'll be thinking of different colors like, oh, red means love. I really want to show love in here. Or, this means this, or I want to do it more literally. You get to make a lot of decisions like that that I'm not going to know about unless you decide to peel back the curtain and show me. So it's going to be really interesting how people color it. You don't have to be really literal or perfect at all. The lines are there. You can have fun with it. Well, I want to remind people, um, we do have big 18 by 24 prints on view here at the museum. Welcome to Color, the Stark Cultural Venues Coloring Book Exhibition is on view in our community art gallery um, through September 25th. Um, so you can come in and see that. As Karen mentioned, we do have a time-lapse video of her creating that drawing. Um, and I think you said it, it's about eight to 10 hours of work that we've condensed down into 40 minutes. You've never seen anyone draw quite as fast as you have in this video that we did of Karen. So so please do come by to see that exhibit. Also, you can download the coloring book online at startculturalvenues.org. Or if you're here at the museum, we do have printed copies available for you um, to take home and enjoy. And I'm so glad, Karen, that you mentioned you don't have to necessarily color in the lines. Um, I know that that can be intimidating to people, but there's really all sorts of opportunities with this for sure. Well, very good. I think we're going to call today's program a wrap. I cannot thank you all enough for joining us. Um, and we will be making this program available at a later date um, on YouTube. So you'll be able to uh, watch this program and um, relive all the fun discoveries and maybe make some more as we go. Um, I hope you all have a great afternoon. And thank you again for joining us.